Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Yunshan, GovInsider's Deputy Editor, and welcome to Unveiling the Secrets to an Agile Government. The world has demonstrated immense agility over the past year, delivering modern applications to serve citizens and respond quickly to changes. What kinds of tech and strategies can help governments get services into the hands of their citizens faster? Over the next hour, we will be exploring the answers to this question as we discuss the key pillars in building a successful cloud native and container strategy that is truly open, agile, and resilient. A huge thank you to our partners at SUSE for making this session possible. Now, please jump, join me to welcome our amazing speakers for today. We have Lee Hong Yi, who is the Director of Open Government Products at GovTech Singapore. We have Elan, who is the Deputy Director of Program Management at Singapore's Home Team Science and Technology Agency, or HDX. We also have Setia Ji, who is the head of Java Digital Service in West Java, Indonesia. And last but certainly not least, we have Vishal Gariwala, who is the Chief Technology Officer for SUSE for APJ and Greater China. First up today is Hong Yi, who is the Director of the Open Government Products Team. The team takes lessons from big tech companies and applies them to solve public sector problems. He'll be sharing more on the intriguing story behind his unit and the impact of his work. Hong Yi, over to you. Thank you. Hey everyone, uh, so my name's Hong and today I'm going to be sharing with you about our team Open Government Products and how we're doing rapid experimental product development in the Singapore government. So this is who we are. We're a team of about 40 or so engineers, designers and data scientists who build technology for the public good. And here are some of the products that we've built. So you might recognize some of them. So Parking SG is probably our most well-known you know, consumer product, but we've built a whole bunch of new products, especially the, over the past like two years or so. Um, there's Postman, which is responsible for the you know, gov.sg WhatsApp updates, if you guys are getting that from uh, on your phones. Um, there's Scam Shield, which is a soft app that we've rolled out to help uh, block scam messages and scam calls and help report them, uh, because that's ramped up a lot in the last couple of years. Um, as well as those of you who have come into Singapore and I've been put on, uh, put on SHN, you might have paid for that, uh, your hotel stay and swab with using pay.gov.sg. And you know, when, you've been, when you've been in quarantine order, you've installed the home app on your phone, not to report your symptoms and check in and things like that. So the premise of the team is quite simple. So what if we operated like a modern tech company, but worked, what if we built an organization that operated like a modern tech company, but worked on public sector problems? And what I mean by this is that our mission is threefold. Experiment, exemplify, and evangelize. So we experiment not just with new technologies, but with new organizational and management practices. We exemplify this in our own operations. So this is not just a theoretical exploration, but something that we make that's really, really practical. And then we evangelize the best of these practices to the rest of the public service, because that's the end goal. The end goal is to try and turn not just one small team, but the whole public service into a sort of agile, modern tech-driven um, you know, organization. So the first thing I want to talk about is our, use, our, our usability and impact of our products that we've built, because you know, if we can't get that, then the rest of this is sort of moot. Um, so kicking off, we have go.gov.sg. So this is probably the most broadly seen of our apps. So you might have seen these links you know, around Singapore all over the place, you know, go.gov this, and like seen these QR codes, which you can scan um, that bring you to official government site. And it's a pretty simple app. Basically, it's a link shortener that we built in a hackathon a couple of years ago. And instead of having to use bit.ly or tinyurl or anything like that, you just go.gov.sg slash, you know, whatever. And it brings you to a, and, and, and these short links can only be created by government officers. So you know that you can trust them as sort of official sources of information. You're not going to get fished or like put, brought into some kind of scammy site. Um, I think uh, these numbers are a little outdated, but basically we have about 74,000 links created with over 76 million clicks on the links. Um, and I think it's ramped up much more. I think we're about 120 million uh, actually in the last few months. Um, yeah, so, so you know, small hackathon project and it's grown quite a lot. Um, next, we have FormSG. And FormSG is basically like you know, Google Forms, but for the government. Um, it's quite simple. Basically, you see the interface here on the right. You, a government officer can sign in and you know, just a few clicks and uh, drag and drop, and you can create a digital form that looks something like this. Um, so compared to the traditional approach of building, a, uh, you know, having to like you know, put together a contract, do, do procurement, work with the IT vendor, and go back and forth for like six or seven months to get something the other, you can put together a form like this in just about 20, 30 minutes. It's really, really quick, um, just like Google Forms. Um, and yeah, 
Form SG, I mean, we're about over 41,000 forms created, and we've actually hit over 100 million form submissions recently, just, just last month. So, um, yeah, it's, it's being used everywhere from, like, you know, education to healthcare to transport, like, um, almost every, like, and for those of you who've done your national service in the last month, uh, in, in, in the last couple of months, um, sometimes they use Form SG in order to do your sort of, like, you know, NS surveys at the end of the experience to see how, how, see how it went. To give you an idea of the kind of, like, Government specific features that we build in into Form SG to make it, you know, that that, uh, uh, that 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 require us to use this instead of Google Forms is uh, sort of verified phone numbers and email addresses. So simple thing. Government needs to collect official information, and we didn't know that the person interacting with us is a, you know, a, this is a point of contact. And so we built in a simple uh, kind of form question, which lets us send an OTP so that we can verify that email or phone number that you put in is indeed, you know, the correct one. So next we have Isomer, and Isomer is really, uh, is really simple. It's a basic website template and hosting system where it's a really, we strip, we take all the complexity of the website, really strip it down to the bare bones. And so when a government agency needs to bring up a new website, all they need to do is change the content and boom, they have a new website really, really quickly. And to give you an idea of how quickly, um, at the start of last year, when we were sort of bringing up governments, rolling out a lot of initiatives, uh, not to help, you know, help all the different businesses and, and households uh, when, when the COVID circuit breaker started, um, we launched a Singapore Together site from request to launch of the website in just one and a half days. So this is not like, you know, like from starting to build or rolling out, like literally from the request coming into the website going out in just a day and a half, which is, you know, really quick by government standards. I know you can do this on some other uh, private sector platforms in quite a quick time as well, but within government, that was a pretty, pretty big feat. Um, Isomer is on over 76 websites right now and with over 15 million sites visits across all the different Isomer sites. Um, so, I mean, not, not, it's not huge compared to, you know, some other countries, but for Singapore with only like five, six million people, 15 million site visits is, you know, basically everyone in Singapore multiple times across the given websites. Um, next, we have Homer. So, you know, then we have other smaller product, other pro products as well. So, we have Homer, which again, as I mentioned previously, for those of you who came into Singapore and you're on quarantine order, like this app, you install your phone in order to do your reporting of symptoms and things like that. You have Postman, which is our mass messaging tool to send out the gov.sg WhatsApp messages, as well as many others. As well as some new experimental products like SGID, which is our sort of like, which is one of our new uh, sort of research attempts to try and build privacy, uh, privacy and like distributed data storage into an identity protocol. So a question we often get is, how's our reliability and security, given that these are sort of like when experimental team and doing things in an agile way, right? And it's a big fear of people when, when people get to a sort of agile manner, like, is the reliability and security good? And so far, I would say, yeah, it's pretty good. Um, Parking SG has been up since launch and it's had a pretty much 99.99% uptime. So it pretty much has no downtime. Um, Postman has a 99.76% uptime. We had one outage uh, like a month or so after launch, but other than that, it's been running pretty smoothly. And I, this is my, perhaps my favorite set for Isomer, which is, a web, which is our website template again. Um, a non-Isomer site, an average government website, goes down for about 900 minutes a year. So, I mean, it's not terrible it's a whole, across a whole year, but it's not great. With Isomer, we managed to reduce that 100 times just under nine minutes a year. And again, this is not by doing stuff like really expensive or really like fancy engineering. It's really just about like taking what the bare essentials are, stripping away all the non-essential components and getting down to sort of a rock solid, simple a set of components that we can then scale very easily. Um, we maintain like reasonably good uptime across all our different products. And like, yeah, we, we try to get, make, get rid of the, like the maintenance windows that are very common in different government applications. And yeah, and actually, and so this is a question that we often get in terms of security, because one of the constraints that we have, uh, one of the concerns people have in governments, you know, when you follow things a new way, we don't follow standard government pro, uh, process in terms of security, but we try to have, we, we try to make sure we hit our, uh, stand, hit our outcomes in terms of security. So because we're doing things in a sort of new experimental agile fashion, we want to make sure that security is not compromised, right? And so the way we do that is firstly by documenting what we actually are doing, even if it's not what, even if it's not, uh, what is traditionally done within, within government, we try to document and write our own frameworks and guides for how we do this. And then we continuously test the outcomes of security by inviting sort of like industry standard uh, pen testing firms to come and test and make sure that, you know, even if we're, even if we're doing something slightly differently from how the government's traditionally done it, uh, whether or not we are, our websites can be compromised, whether or not data can be exfiltrated, and all these sort of things is verified uh, is verified at, at, at sort of you know proof in the pudding kind of level, if that makes sense. Um, and so finally, like cheaper and faster, right? So this is the aspirational goal. You want to have good products, really secure, and built cheaper and faster. 
And just to give you an order of magnitude, this is sort of the size of the various teams on the various products we have. And we found, so go.gov.sg, which is you know, everywhere, it's just about two people. Parking SG was built with just about three people. And, um, and Form SG, which is sort of, you know, literally one of our biggest products and runs digital forms across the government, is just a team of just about six people. Um, Counterintuitively, we found that actually having these small, very well-contained teams allows the teams to be much more effective and move a lot more quickly, um, which uh, with, with well, you know, while still having really good outcomes. So actually, smaller teams not only are cheaper and uh, cheaper and faster, but they actually tend to be more effective. Um, at least that's what our experience has been uh, in terms of building government products. Um, to give you a sense of this costs, parking SG, we managed to get the infrastructure cost down to just $2,500 a month. So like really simple and really small. Isomer, which hosts all 76, all 74 websites, just co costs just $840 a month. Um, not per website, for all 74 websites. And the, again, the way we do this is just by having really simple static site infrastructure that we can, you know, that we, uh, that, that's super easily scalable. So you don't have to rebuild custom stuff over and over again. You pretty much just like use one template and one set of infrastructure, and then you just sort of scale that across the government. So to give you a, scale, a sense of how we achieve this, um, this is a case study that we did for uh, DGMC, which is, uh, which is our sort of digital medic, like, you know, if you go to a doctor, you get a doctor's note. Rather than getting a piece of paper, you can get an SMS on your phone nowadays. When we move, we move, we migrated the off government infrastructure onto sort of like just, you know, off the shelf commercial infrastructure. And by doing that, just by migrating, same app, same features, same reliability, in fact, slightly improved, we managed to get the cost down from $21,000 a month to just under $600 a month. And this is a 35 times cost reduction in price, in like infrastructure costs, simply by just moving onto sort of off-the-shelf infrastructure. Which brings us to sort of like, uh, like you know, the question of this, right? So we achieve, so how do we do this? How do we get impactful products built quickly and securely and reliably um, at a much lower cost? And the first big thing is we use off-the-shelf cloud software. I, I, and so this is, this is actually a really, the, the, the point of this like really needs to be emphasized because I find that when you talk to governments, uh, often about you know the cloud and moving to the cloud, they think about you know AWS or Google Cloud Platform or like you know Azure, Microsoft Azure and all that. Which is don't get me wrong, and it's very useful, and we use that too. But that's just like a small, small part about like how a cloud system can function. Um, so just give you a sense upfront, we use Codility and Recruity in order to manage our interview uh, our interview pipeline. Um, internally, the team uses Miro and Figma in order to collaborate on design. We use GitHub and Pingdom and Chronitor in order to manage our production deployments. And just, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis within the team, we use like things like OnePassword and Monday.com and like Jira in order to do project management. Um, again, with it, like in the private sector, all this is like fairly straightforward, but within the government, this idea of cloud, uh, where, where th this idea of the cloud being just infrastructure is, is, is like only tapping on a small, small fraction of this. And actually a lot of our, uh, a lot of our value comes from, you know, using all these different, uh, using things off the shelf because our team wouldn't function otherwise. Um, we run an annual hackathon. So for the month of January on OGP, all of us uh, basically take like all non-critical work pauses. We go around visiting different government agencies, talking to like the meteorological society, nurses, teachers, things like that. Then we come back and we like build prototypes that we present at the end of the month. And this is not just like a fun exploratory thing. This is actually where most of our projects come from, like really from these explorations. So Last year, we had 28 different hackathon projects. Of the 28 projects, seven of them are now live products that are running. So yeah, it's, this is part of our main production and ideation process. It is not an exploratory thing. It is, it is how we get good ideas and spawn these things quickly. Um, and finally, it comes back down to the people. So running an agile and productive team doesn't work if you don't have the environment and the you know, people, care, people operations don't take care of that. So we've written whole new career schemas for software engineers, product designers, data scientists, product managers, because the government didn't traditionally have these career schemes. And so we work with you know, people, our friends from Google, Indeed, Apple, Facebook, and all to like try and piece, uh, put together a career scheme for these people in the government, as well as update our sort of performance evaluation systems in order to be able to, in order to, be able to handle this. So this is an example of the of performance, a sample performance evaluation sheet every OGP officer gets every six months. You know, we do peer, you know, and, and so, you know, again, pretty standard things, 360 feedback, peer evaluations, uh, clear focuses on strengths and areas for improvement and things like that. Um, but yeah, so, so very, very quickly, that is, uh, that is our team. That is Open Government Products. Um, and thanks for listening. Thank you so much, Hongyu, for your insights on how OGP has managed to build and launch so many new tools so, so quickly.
And next, we have Vishal from SUSE. He'll be sharing tips and tricks on accelerating innovation with open source and a cloud native approach. Vishal, take it away. Thank you very much. Um, and also very good afternoon to every, everyone who has tuned in. Uh, so my name is Vishal. I work at SUSE Singapore. And uh, you know, I'm the CTO for the uh, Asia Pacific, Japan, and you know, Greater China region. Now, I'd like to start off, uh, you know, today's presentation by really, you know, emphasizing the fact that, uh, you know, the times that we are living in, you know, really unprecedented times, unprecedented change, and you know, as I speak today, we are still in the midst of, uh, you know, the worst pandemic that we have uh, experienced in our lives. Uh, you know, and if you couple with that, what we see happening from a geopolitical dynamics uh, you know, angle, that really adds to how the uh, environment is evolving. Uh, you know, in such situations, uh, citizens will often look to governments to, you know, get some level of resilience, some level of reassurance, uh, you know, and uh, some level of, uh, you know, assistance from the governments. Uh, so that they can get some level of, uh, you know, sanity in their lives. And, uh, you know, this could be examples of this could be looking to government agencies to roll out new initiatives and new solutions, uh, you know, faster to handle this sort of, uh, you know, changes, uh, you know, making timely and accurate information available and also ensuring that whatever services that they are rolling out, it's uh, consumable by not just the digital natives, but also by people who may not be as digitally savvy. Now, obviously, all of this places a great amount of pressure uh, on top of uh, you know IT leaders uh, because now they are having this uh, a great amount of uh, things that they need to deliver back to the citizens and. Uh, when you look at that, uh, it's imperative that we adopt the right uh, IT strategy uh, so that it will allow us to gain the agility that we'll need. Uh, and you know, one of the you know IT strategies that uh, really can help uh, government agencies to become very agile is using a cloud native approach uh, when you are rolling out your citizen services. And I I think uh, you know cloud native as a term is not new. Uh, I believe all of you would have heard of it, but I think it's still good that we, you know, reiterate what it is. You know, in a nutshell, it is nothing but an uh, an approach to building and running applications using, uh, you know, cloud need, uh, you know, technologies that have been made popular, you know, uh, by cloud computing. Uh, and you know, when you use a cloud native approach, you are looking at more about, you know, creating the app and deploying the app, and not so much about where the actual application uh, you know, is going to be running. You know, one of the common uh, you know, and popular concepts uh, that you know, people talk about when building out cloud native uh, you know, applications is uh, this notion of building a microservice, which is the uh, anti-pattern, I would say completely different from what we used to do in the past where we spent six months, nine months building a monolithic application that contains everything. Microservice architecture is a bit different, smaller, nimbler microservices that can be independently maintained, independently tested, independently deployed. Uh, These services itself uh, adopt a different software engineering methodology, uh, commonly known as you know, continuous delivery uh, engineering, uh, software engineering approach, where what happens is that now you have the ability to roll out and deploy your service anytime, at any time, and also in an automated fashion. And this really helps you, you know, gain the agility that you need. Now, with regards to where you want this microservice to be running, it could be anywhere. It could be in your private data center. It could be on your public clouds. It could even reside on the edge, for example, in, in public schools or in the hospitals. Well, the choice is yours. It's all about, you know, the uh, type of benefits that they are looking at and, and what sort of operating model that you are trying to achieve? Is it aligned with cost efficiencies or is it going to be aligned with, uh, you know, uh, you know, making the best use of all the resources that you have available? You get the freedom and flexibility to choose the operating environment uh, for the services that you are rolling out. Now, cloud native basically consists of three things. You know, first of all, the uh, architecture, which is microservices based, the software delivery approach, which is based on DevOps principles such as continuous delivery. And obviously there is the technology piece and the technology that is really underpinning cloud native is container and Kubernetes. And I believe this is something that 
you probably have heard of. Uh, it's gaining a lot of traction. In fact, Forrester did a study uh, recently and cloud native containers, Kubernetes, a great amount of awareness within you know, enterprises, you know, even in, in the government sector and developers generally are playing around with it. And it's also, it also figures as a top priority for IT leaders. However, adoption is low. You know, 90% of the applications are still using legacy technology. But uh, the good news is that the growth uh, is going to be high. In fact, over the course of the next, you know, uh, one year, we can expect the growth to be, you know, more than 50% uh, with regards to new container uh, projects. Now, so why is there such interest uh, in containers and Kubernetes? You know, you know, first and foremost, using container and Kubernetes technology will help your application teams accelerate innovation. They'll be able to get their apps to market faster just because, you know, of the way that they're building apps now is going to be, it's very, very different. And you will also be able to build a level of differentiation uh, because you're able to roll out more capabilities faster and in, a, in an agile manner. Uh, secondly, you also eliminate infrastructure dependencies, uh, which is very important. You want to be able to ensure that whatever app you are running can run seamlessly and can be ported seamlessly to another operating environment, to another public cloud provider, or could be to the edge environment. So you get this portability, and with this comes a flexibility to choose the infrastructure of your choice without even actually having to worry about it. And what this means from an operations angle is that you get a great level of consistency because now you know that you, 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 you'll be able to predict how your application will be running on your infrastructure. And it's gonna be the same, the same way that it runs everywhere. Uh, and this will also help you get uh, a greater, greater sense of a reassurance from a security angle because you know that the application will conform and behave in the same way uh, no matter where you are running. Uh, there are a lot of, uh, you know, uh, technologies, uh, vendors out there. Uh, and SUSE is one of the, uh, you know, leading vendors in the cloud native space with a world-class uh, cloud native portfolio that can help you in your cloud native containers and Kubernetes journey. Uh, and, you know, our solution ensures that whatever applications you're building can be run, operated, managed seamlessly from the data center to the cloud and even to your edge, uh, you know, environments. And one of the things that really make us very, very unique is that we are a 100% open source company. Everything that we use as part of our software is 100% open source. And we also uh, adopt a philosophy that whatever we create will make it available uh, in a manner that can be consumed without uh, hampering the freedom that the customer can get. So what this means is that you will not experience a situation where if you go with SUSE, you'll need to go all in with our technology. You know, we give you the freedom and flexibility to mix and match and choose the best of great products that work for you uh, so that you are not locked in. And you know the, 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 the product or the offering from SUSE that helps you build your cloud native uh, you know, applications uh, and establish a cloud native uh, you know, framework within your organization is known as uh, SUSE Rancher. Uh, it's a it's an enterprise grade container management platform that is completely built on open source technologies, and it will help to address the needs of both your development teams and your IT operations teams. So developers will get the full uh, you know uh, automation experience with the way they build the applications, deploy the applications, and upgrade the applications uh, on any uh, you know footprint from the public cloud to the edge. Uh, operations team, on the other hand, they are very, very concerned with regards to uh, the stability of the environment. They will have great level of visibility uh, and also define security policies in a consistent manner that will be uh, applied uh, you know, across their platform, across all of the applications. Uh, and you know, this platform itself will be able to support any of the Kubernetes distributions out there. As you know, a lot of different vendors. In fact, the public cloud providers have a different version of the distribution. And what, what our approach is, you choose whatever works for you. We'll give you all the capabilities that you know I just talked about so that you don't need to be locked into a particular vendor. And what that means is with the, the, with the SUSE Rancher solution, you can have one platform to manage 
any type of Kubernetes across any infrastructure from the data center to the cloud, to the developer machines and all the way to the branch, uh, you know, as well as the edge. And we have been recognized uh, you know, by the various analysts. In fact, Gartner has um, put us in the leaders uh, section, leaders segment in both of its uh, Forrester Wave reports. Uh, the most recent one uh, just happened uh, last year. Now, as a company, we have been in the open source space for a very, very long time, in fact, almost 30 years. And a lot of people may not know that we were the first company, the, the vendor that actually brought Linux into mainframe. Uh, and today, Linux is everywhere. We actually brought Linux in the form of SUSE Linux Enterprise uh, you know, to, uh, to the enterprises. Uh, and over the years, we have done a lot of innovation and joint work with SAP, with the likes of AWS. Um, and the, the, the best thing that happened just last month is we, we went public and we officially, and we officially listed on the you know, Frankfurt Stock Exchange. Uh, so we are doing a lot of things in the open source world in the cloud native space. And um, yeah, uh, we want to help our customers and you know, uh, you know, government agencies, uh, you know, gain a level of you know success uh, in in the cloud native journey. Uh, thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you so much, Vishal, for your thoughts on what governments can do to become more agile. It's now time for us to dive into the panel discussion. We will be hearing stories of how governments have built tech rapidly learn from their successes, and explore ways for all of us to move forward. If you have any questions, do type them in the chat, and remember to tell us who you'd like to direct your question to. Now let's bring up our panelists and dive right in. Let's begin by talking a bit about what we've achieved in such a short amount of time. And Elon, I'm gonna bring my first question to you. You lead a team um, to build, you know, your team built an inter-ministry platform that allows travelers to enter Singapore safely and all this was done in a very short amount of time. So can you tell us a bit more about this platform and the impact that it has had? Yes, uh, thanks, uh, Shen Yan. Good afternoon. I hope everybody could hear me loud and clear. Uh, first of all, thanks everyone for taking the time off your busy schedule to join the session. Okay, uh, let me dive straight to the question. So prior to the formation of a safe travel office, various government agencies were uh, practically managing the respective travel lanes. For instance, MTI was uh, uh, managing business travelers wanting to come into Singapore. MOE was managing students who want to come into Singapore. And ICA was managing social travelers wanting to come into Singapore for compassionate reason or reasons with family ties and so on. So the safe travel operation was somewhat uh, managed in a very decentralized manner by the various government agencies. So while this has been manageable uh, with a relatively low travel volume, but when the borders were progressively opened up, it was not sustainable. So Safe Travel Office was actually formed in uh, July 2020 to serve as a central uh, one-stop gateway to streamline and automate uh, various safe travel uh, related processes. So SQ actually developed an online platform uh, using the various tools. Uh, this platform actually provided as a one-stop gateway for all information related to safe travel operation, application, and so on. So travelers need not uh, hop between uh, various government agencies. They just uh, do everything in our portal. So our portal actually fronted more than uh, 10 government agencies, and uh, it actually hide all the complexities surrounding uh, entry application uh, to arrival and post-arrival and so on. Uh, so because it actually had uh, numerous backend interfaces and data sharing. So I would say the impact is it gave the travelers uh, uh, much convenience, including the citizens and all the foreign travelers. It just gave uh, much great convenience. Thanks, Yulian. Fantastic. And for Setiaji, what tools has Java Digital Service built to help West Java cope with the pandemic? Yeah, okay. Uh... Yeah, we have uh, super apps. We call the super apps because uh, we have uh, around 35 modules in there. And uh, these applications uh, actually uh, support us yeah, to manage the COVID-19 in the West Java. As you know, we have uh, around uh, almost 50 million people live in the West Java. So uh, we serve uh, around there. Yes, it's, it's maybe around 20 million people yeah, to uh, use these applications. Yeah. And 
uh, what, uh, how uh, and what tools we built uh, for the these applications. Yeah, actually we use the hybrid system. Yeah, uh, mostly in the cloud uh, we use the um, uh, some services from the cloud uh, providers. Yeah, we built uh, uh, using the uh, not only the containers but also uh, we develop in. Uh, Agile development, yeah, using the microservices and some tools, yeah, yeah. We built this application only uh, 16 days, yeah. This is uh, very fast, yeah, because uh, we use the tools to help us uh, to build the, the this application more uh, quickly, and uh, uh, so we 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 not concern about the infrastructures. We 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 just concern about to. Uh, develop the services or the content on top of uh, our uh, infrastructures. Good. Fantastic. And for that super app that you mentioned with 25 modules, what were some of the things that it could do? Yeah, some of the features, yeah. For example, uh, for uh, uh, quick for self uh, check, uh, I uh, have a COVID or not. And uh, one of the feature is for donations. Yeah, because we need to uh, some support there yeah, from the uh, citizen or the private sectors, and then also for uh, we collaborate with others uh, private sector yeah, to, for test uh, mass mass uh, mass uh, test yeah for COVID nineteen, and also some uh, features yeah uh, not only about the inform uh, for the information for the COVID nineteen, but also some uh, features for uh, volunteers. They can uh, enroll the uh, volunteers to support the governments to manage these situations. Fantastic, that sounds like a really useful all-in-one app there. And for Hongyi, you've briefly mentioned some of the things that your team has built for COVID already, but would you like to share a bit more about some of the COVID-19 tools that OGP has helped to develop for Singapore? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, so there's a bunch of them, right? So starting from quarantine orders, uh, I mean, Homer is the Homer is the Homer is the sort of basic way of uh, having people uh, on mass uh, quarantine order report in symptoms and keep track of anyone who might be getting sick. Um, this was the problem before, like before the app was developed. Basically, we were just like having an army of people call people up by hand, uh, and like obviously not really sustainable. So that's that's one. Um, moving on to like the uh, how would you describe this? The the appointment, like the vaccine side of things, right? So that was the first bit where you just sort of try to contain things and get things down. And now we're at the phase where we're trying to do vaccinations. And so vaccine.gov.sg is uh, our vaccine appointment system. Um, it's, I mean, it's basically we brought us on just like a couple of weeks, but the, the problem statement essentially is that you have like you know, 5 million people and you need to book appointments and you need appointments to be like two weeks apart. And you need to make sure that like the same person goes to the same, like make sure like the same person gets the first or second jab uh, from the same brand and like it's it's not you know it's within whatever constraints um, and so yeah we and so how do you do this in a way especially when the vaccine supply might be a bit uh, complicated and so we came up with a system where we have a pre-registration list where people pre-register and then we can titrate out from the pre-registration list and send uh, and open up you know send people a link by sms or whatever to start booking slots whenever we have vaccine supply that way we can have everyone pre-register all at once whenever they want to but then we don't have this problem of like everyone rushing to get appointments, which may or may not exist, and having to cancel them. So you sort of decouple the registration from the uh, from from the from the booking of appointments, and you know you, you have a much smoother flow there, which I think works pretty well. I mean, um, and the third thing that we're doing now, which is sort of moving on from vaccinations, is testing, uh, which is uh, in Singapore now we have all these uh, sort of rapid antigen ra rapid antigen tests. Um, and so if you go to an event like, you know, like a, a, like a conference or a wedding or something like that, um, basically what you do is you get these, like, you know, there's a sheet of paper there with the QR code on it. And then like you, you, know, you, you take a swab test, you scan the QR code, you fill in the form, and then you scan the same QR code to see the results like 20 minutes later. Um, pretty simple, pretty seamless. And like that's kind of, and so those are the sort of like three big areas that we can focus on. Um, quarantine enforcement, uh, vaccinations, as well as, uh, you know, testing, testing, testing kits. Fantastic. Thank you, Hongi. And I've certainly been one of the enthusiastic users of the pre-registered link. I think that's a really interesting thing, uh, interesting thing that your team has worked on as well. So 
Now that we have an idea of the kinds of citizen services that governments have been able to build in a really short amount of time, let's delve a bit deeper into the journey. So Elon, coming back to you, what were some of the challenges that you faced as your team was pooling together that platform? Um, I think we faced many challenges. Uh, I think the most important was the aggressive timeline and the high expectation uh, for STO to deliver. Um, there were numerous agencies came knocking at our door, pushing us to deliver their uh, various business lanes. So the requirements was actually practically mounting and the pressure was on us to deliver, uh, meeting everybody's needs across government agencies. Yeah, so, and also with the pandemic uh, situation developing globally, the pressure was on us not only to deliver, but also to uh, secure a platform that uh, allow us to scale up and scale down and uh, evolve as the policy uh, and operation evolves to make changes swiftly. So um, with uh, much uh, effort and uh, of course with this various support and uh, success factors, we actually delivered the portal within three weeks from the formation of STO. Uh, that was very uh, fast in my entire career. Uh, the first lane was actually up, uh, open for business in the early weeks of uh, August 2020. And then we progressively developed the rest of the travel regimes. Uh, I would say our job is not, uh, has not ended. Uh, we are still learning and continuously developing. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you for sharing that. And Vishal, I was wondering if you would add on to that. So from your perspective, APJ, Greater China, what are some of the biggest challenges that governments in the region face when they're trying to build digital services quickly? Yeah, sure. Uh, and I think I'll talk more from, uh, you know, more from a technology angle. You know, there are, there are, there are obviously the, um, you know, the people aspects, but, you know, from a technology angle, uh, a lot of the cool things that we want to do today uh, that leverages, you know, like, you know, what Satyaji talks about, you know, the public cloud, you know, containers, you know, Kubernetes, requires a lot of skills. And I think one of the challenges that we see, right, that, uh, you know, at SUSE is that there is a, there's a lack of this skill set in the market today. Uh, so that really is, is one of the challenges because uh, while you can go online and learn about it, but you know, to implement it at scale in a production environment, uh, that is not simple, right? That requires, uh, you know, a different level of experience. Uh, you know, secondly, there is also a lot of options out there in the market available to be, right? So how do you then decide what to choose? Because there are a lot of technologies that look similar that will allow you to do the same thing, uh, you know, but then there are those uh, slight nuances and, uh, you know, that can really uh, impact your, the way that you are going to build your entire strategy because uh, if, you, if you bet on the wrong, uh, you know, vendor, then you might be, it might impact you, you know, in the future. Uh, you know, one of the common things that often comes across is uh, with regards to, you know, concerns that a lot of, uh, you know, government agencies, not just government agencies, you know, even in, in the private sector, I'll, I'll speak about that, is, is that, you know, while a lot of uh, them recognize that, hey, public cloud is great, there's also this concern that they do not want to go, be locked in and go all in. So multi-cloud is a, a trend that is, uh, you know, you know, very common these days with a lot of, uh, you know, customers looking at, you know, one, more than one, you know, cloud provider. Uh, that so, how do you then, you know, decide, right? So that's another challenge, right? Do you want to go all in with one public cloud? No, that's great, right? But the thing is, the deeper and deeper you go with one vendor, you may be locked in, uh, and then if you decide that, hey, to get some level of cost efficiencies, I want to move to another cloud provider. How simply or easy that can be. And I think that the final one, which is something that, uh, you know, Hong Yi talked about uh, in, in, in a way, it's a, there's a different mindset that, uh, you know, uh, companies need to adopt, in, in, especially in the government sector, the, the mindset of, you know, fail fast and fail often using short sprints uh, and not being afraid to fail and uh, not taking it as, you know, a, somebody who has delivered bad code. Because if you want to uh, adopt an agile uh, way of delivering software, you got to do it very, very quickly, very fast. And it's, you can't run away from the fact that, you know, your first few iterations will result in code that is really buggy or, you know, doesn't work. So these are some of the things that I'm seeing, uh, you know, uh, that, that are potential, you know, challenges or obstacles. 
Fantastic. Thank you for that, Vishal. And Satyaji, I'm going to bring my next question to you. So what are some of the new challenges that uh, Java Digital Service has had to address in the past year? And how has your team's approach changed during the pandemic? Yeah, uh, actually, uh, when we talked the COVID-19, uh, we didn't have samples yet, the good samples yet. We need, uh, we don't, we don't have time to learn uh, about the COVID-19, but we need to quickly uh, produce some uh, system or some applications here. Yeah. We have some principle to manage this uh, COVID-19. First, about the transparency, we need to inform the quickly about the situations COVID-19 in the West Java. And then the second thing is uh, we need to innovative. Uh, to produce some applications, some services uh, to the citizens. And then the next thing, we need to collaboration because the government cannot run by itself and we, we need to engage more uh, startup, more private sectors to collaborate with the governments to, uh, to support the super apps. And then also the next thing is about the data driven. So uh, we, we, what we face, uh, uh, actually, I think uh, what the FISA said about the talents, talent itself, yeah. How we use the cloud, uh, because as you know, the cloud uh, this, uh, is uh, some new from, for our site, yeah. So uh, we, with uh, some partners uh, to, to get us to, to learn from more fast about the, this, uh, uh, these tools. And uh, we, 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 also, some facing uh, how we build the application quickly, so the citizen mm, uh, cannot uh, wait yet yeah, for the uh, public uh, service uh, application. So we use uh, the main services. No need to buy some uh, infrastructures. We just use the tools uh, already there. Uh, so uh, this is uh, uh, what we face. Not only about the skills, but uh, the tools what we want to use here. Amazing. Thank you for sharing that. And now we've heard a bit about the obstacles that may come up. So now let's go into how we can overcome them together. And Elon, you essentially had to take over work that spans across multiple different agencies. So how did your team actually overcome that, that first obstacle? Okay, thanks. So uh, there were many factors uh, uh, that enable us to overcome the obstacle. Uh, I will share the three of the key factors enable us to deliver the portal within a short amount of time. Uh, firstly, I would say is the modern cloud application architecture. Actually, HDX uh, team has actually embarked on a cloud journey ahead of time, and they actually built a, a secured cloud uh, with relevant key capabilities and so on. So the objective was for the e-services team to deliver e-services rapidly. So that uh, tech stack kind of help us uh, deliver our services very fast. Uh, that architecture actually had various capabilities from uh, sync pass authentication, provisioning of electronic payment and so on. So everything was there for us to use. And uh, as uh, Vishal also mentioned, the cloud itself also offered various uh, platform as a service, software as a services. And uh, we use numerous uh, open sources and with all these uh, tools and open sources that is available, we were able to develop the portal fairly quickly. Our, our mantra was not to reinvent the wheel, uh, use whatever is available in the cloud and, and achieve the rapid development. And uh, we also went with uh, uh, serverless architecture, microservices, database as a services. And these are the technology behind cloud that give us the scalability and the availability that we badly needed. And also the team uh, adopted uh, CICD, continuous integration and continuous uh, development, uh, which allowed the DevOps team to uh, create quality software with automated security screening and so on. So overall, I would say the cloud-based application architecture actually was like a, a service apartment. Uh, it has all the services that we want, we just have to move in, consume the service that we want, and build the service, and once we don't need, we just taper down. So it gave us the agility to build the solution rapidly. Thank you for that, Elon. I particularly liked your um, analogy actually about how you know the cloud-based architecture is something like a service apartment, and you can sort of move around the things that you need for there. And Vishal, do you have any thoughts on that? 
Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, uh, you know, what, what Elon mentioned about moving around, uh, that is something sometimes we may take for granted because sometimes, uh, you know, like what I mentioned, uh, we want to have the freedom to choose the best of breed software. But often what happens is that uh, we may end up, uh, you know, by going too deeply into one, uh, with one vendor, we may end up uh, in a situation where we may not have the, the freedom and flexibility to, to, you know, swap software. And, you know, therefore, um, you know, choosing the right, you know, set of technologies that give you a level of abstraction and doesn't, that and prevents you from being too tied with, with a particular, let's say, cloud provider, for example, it's, it's uh, you know, it's, it's critical. I think the other point as well is that you know, it's very clear that a lot of the innovation that happens today, it's all because of open source, uh, open source software. And, and that's also one of the reasons why, uh, you know, we are able to do things much, much faster because uh, open source makes, uh, you know, all this innovation accessible to, you know, uh, everyone out there. Thank you for that, Vishal. And Satyaji, I'm going to bring my next question to you. Um, earlier when Vishal was talking about how we cannot be afraid to fail when we build services, I saw you nodding very vigorously. So can you tell us a bit about your secret sauce to delivering services faster? Yeah, uh, we have the team, yeah, uh, we call the West Java Digital Services, yeah. These teams, uh, mostly uh, the young people, yeah, we, we with them uh, together develop this application. Uh, actually, this is, uh, my team is, uh, uh, have uh, good talents, yeah. And uh, we build the structures like uh, startup. Uh, so this is the uh, still government, but uh, startup, like startup. And uh, we we have some uh, tribes and also some squad to develop some applications, and we divide into some squads. Yeah, actually we have around 150 for the uh, for the people uh, support these applications. Yeah, so uh, within this uh, comb combination within the governments and also uh, the how the startup uh, develop the applications. Yeah, like. Uh, uh, agile development, sprint, etc. So we can develop more fast, uh, not, uh, not only about the development, but also uh, using the tools like uh, uh, public cloud. Fantastic, thank you for that. And now if we could just reflect a bit over the past year and think about what were some of the biggest lessons we've learned. Hongi, would you like to start with sharing what are some of your biggest takeaways from the past year? I think the biggest takeaway is that time to delivery isn't a nice to have. It's a, it's a core feature. Like, when in government, we're very used to having these very long timelines, right? Oh, we have this, we're going, we're building things as if, and you know, we'll plan this for the next two, three years. Uh, but especially when it, uh, especially when it comes to things like crisis, especially when it comes to things like, um, you know, sort of changing environment, something that is delivered Two years from now, it's not an income. It's not just oh, government slow. We'll get slowly get there. Like it's actually useless. So you, it's 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 a very very concrete trade off that you're making, where it's, where you have to recognize that, yeah, it, it's not just a matter of like pushing yourself to get things faster because you want to achieve things. It's really a question of like you have to. You're you're looking at a space where. If, you're, if the thing that you're developing is only relevant for the next three to six months, but extremely relevant for the next three to six months, you have to be very, very precise in like cutting things out, choosing things, getting things done quickly. And even if it's not perfect, right? Even if it's not like exactly what you want, even if it's missing this feature, even if it's got this security flaw, even if it's got this hosting thing, or like if you don't, that, 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 there's a window. There's a window at which it is relevant. Uh, and outside of that window, it's not. And so, yeah, I think that that, um, extreme focus on deliver on deliverability, not just as a like, you know, old government slow, but really as a like, how do we get this as out as quickly as possible? Because that's only relevant time. I think it's super critical. Yeah. For sure. And I think we can see setting up a website within 1.5 days. I think that's definitely a huge key um, indicator of you know, the attitude towards bringing things together quickly. And for Elon, what about you? What are some of the biggest lessons that you've learned from the past year? Okay, um, echoing and only, I think gone are the days where we purchase, set up and build infrastructures on our own and take months or years to deliver an IT system. I think the push for digitalization has actually brought the challenge back to the IT team to deliver innovative solutions rapidly. Yeah, so I think the CIOs, CTOs and IT managers 
have to start embracing uh, modern application architectures and they should also uh, adopt product centric delivery approach. Uh, don't garner for delivering a full flash IT system, go with minimum viable products to deliver uh, and uh, market the solutions uh, quickly. Yep. So I think we have to adopt such technology and strategies to pace the digitalization efforts. And Park Setiaji, how about you? What are some of the biggest lessons that you've learned from the past year? Yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, we, uh, we need the big co collaborations, yeah. Uh, so we need to build like a government as a platform. So every uh, startup, every uh, organization or every tech vendor and etc. can involve in our platforms. And that's the next thing is uh, how we can uh, choose the right tools here yeah, to uh, because we we can uh, think too too much uh, too long yeah, uh, because uh, we need to act uh, to fast to build it quickly and etc. So uh, and then we need to focus about the content and services. No need to focus the infrastructure because infrastructure is, is in there. We can uh, use uh, the services uh, using the uh, public uh, cloud. Yes, and I think Pak Setiaji, you brought up a phrase that's really, really interesting, government as a platform or government as a startup. So I think that's really the core idea that we're, we're trying to bring out here, you know, how governments can move a lot more quickly to deliver services faster. And Vishal, if I could turn to you, what are some of the concrete steps that governments can take to move towards this idea of governments as a platform? Uh, yeah, right. Uh, so... You know, I think a lot of the, you know, important points have been covered uh, by a lot of our speakers today. But uh, I think, uh, you know, first and foremost, you know, like I mentioned, the, the whole, the, the culture, you know, needs to change. Because uh, there, there's a very big difference uh, when you adopt traditional, you know, waterfall-like uh, architecture and building applications over six to nine months. And when you use newer, you know, agile DevOps style, you know, methodologies, where there's a culture of, uh, you know, trying to, you know, like I mentioned, fail fast and fail often. And, uh, you know, the approach and the mentality around, hey, not expecting uh, a, a perfect software the first time around, that should be okay. We should have that sort of a mentality. Uh, I think um, it's also imperative that uh, we start to take a different approach towards the cloud. You know, uh, I the I know that in when when it comes to government, uh, you know, security is very key. Things like data governance, uh, it, it's very very important. But then you know, like you know, our speakers mentioned when you are hit with something like uh, a pandemic, like what we saw. Uh, you know what? What what we see from the private sector is the greatest amount of innovation that has happened on the public cloud in one year. Uh, that we have never seen this sort of innovation because when you find that you can't move out of your house, you have no choice but uh, you know to adopt the cloud. So I think attitudes towards cloud, uh, you know, using the cloud, you know, needs to change. Uh, you know, plus uh, the whole notion about if we are going to adopt uh, in future. Uh, an IT landscape that is going to probably leverage what we have been using uh, in the past and, you know, all the cloud technologies that are available, that are going to be available in the future. I think, uh, you know, government agencies will also need to, you know, do a lot of, uh, you know, analysis and look at all the options that are available to ensure that while they have uh, the ability to choose uh, from a variety of solutions, they also don't lose uh, the uh, the freedom to make the choices uh, and and end up getting you know you know locked in you know I mentioned about uh, in my presentation how it's so important to have a platform that can work with any types of uh, you know underlying technology or operating systems available uh, and not having to be dictated uh, you know you know by a, a principal vendor as is how things could should be like so I think this these are some of the things you know summarize you know the culture. The perspective towards cloud need cloud computing you know and cloud native and then uh, having an IT strategy that ensures that you know you are adopting a set of technologies that will uh, you know future proof your your overall IT roadmap and uh, you know don't will ensure you don't get locked in to a particular set of technologies or you know or vendor solutions. 
Thank you very much for that, Vishal. And if we were to talk about government as a startup, uh, Hongi, I think that's exactly what you've done with OGP. So what is one piece of advice that you would give to public agencies who are also looking to move towards that more agile model? I would say the, oddly enough, don't try to solve the biggest problems first. Try to solve the most well-defined and concrete problems first. So it's a bit like, it's a bit like attacking a cliff. You know, if there's a big rock wall, you can charge into it and you can try smashing it, but it's a big rock wall, it's not going to help. So what you do is you try to find like you know, small cracks at the edges, you find things and you sort of like hammer in there and slowly bits of it chip off. And if you get enough traction there, the whole thing falls down. Um, I found in government, like, it's a question, like the, the limit often of a project is less the, the sort of, it's less the impact of the project or how technically viable it is, is often it's bureaucratic vulnerability. And often the most impactful projects for better, unfortunately are the most bureaucratically complicated, therefore have an extremely high cost. And so if you're trying to move towards an agile environment, like, you know, you have to account for bureaucratic cost because bureaucratic cost is what kills agile. Um, and so what you, what, what we found to be, what I found to be successful at least is identify not, maybe not like, you know, you know, you're, tr you're trying to cure cancer or something like that. You're, you're all, all like, you know, hospital check-ins, but you're trying to find, okay, what's a very small, obvious, easy win that we can get, latch on there, show, demonstrate success, iterate and grow from there. And then as people get comfortable with that methodology, as people get comfortable with the proof of delivery, uh, and then you go in because, because I mean, the whole point of this discussion is that agile methodologies are relatively uh, uncommon and alien in government. And the primary limit to the adoption is less like how big a target can you hit, but like the, the sort of social proof of getting that to happen. And I think if you focus, and so, so you counterintuitively need to focus on like, you know, getting something small and getting some traction and then slowly, and then, well, not slowly, but like, you know, ramping your way up into, into the core use cases, because if you just try to charge in your core use cases, I mean, people don't trust it because it's different from what they do and it's not going to happen. Um, yeah, that's my take on it. Thank you so much for that, Hong Yi. And we are nearing the end of our session for today. Let's go for a final quick fire round to share what are you hopeful or excited about? And Elon, I'm going to start off with you. Okay. Um, as an IT professional, I'm excited about the infinite opportunities that a modern cloud-based architecture offers. Uh, it, it, with this, I think uh, the uh, process for digitization can be hastened. Uh, cloud offers a lot of subscription-based services you pay for like, like a service apartment. So I think it breaks the methodological thinking and allow government agencies to operate like a startup. Okay, and it, it opens endless possibilities and put government agencies on a transformative track. So I'm, I'm, I would say I'm excited about the endless possibility and agility that the cloud-based architecture offers. Amazing. And Pak Setiaji, if I could turn to you next, what are some things that you are excited or hopeful about? Yeah, actually, we hope not only in West Java yeah, to build the uh, agile uh, governments, but also in other uh, regions in Indonesia. Yeah, uh, so, uh, and then so about the infrastructure itself, yeah, we hope uh, we can more uh, listen, uh, learn about the, how we can manage the hybrid systems using the cloud and also using the on-premises. Uh, because as you know, Indonesia is uh, very wide. Yeah, We have uh, some islands and etc. So how we can combine this uh, technology. Uh, so uh, the technology itself can uh, use not only in city, but also in the remote area. Thank you. Thank you for that. And Hongi, what about you? What are you excited about? Um, I'm pretty excited uh, of I'm pretty excited for 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 the stuff that we built in this pandemic sort of propagate to the rest of how, uh, to the rest of standard operation and like just just for example right working remotely I think is something that everyone has sort of had an inkling that it could have gone on for a while but like it sort of forced the issue and like as much as it sucks um, I think that realization of what actually we can do with tech is being pushed aggressively right like previously people would be like I don't know let's take it slow let's see if we can do it um, but now that's sort of like you know, like actually, actually, yeah, why, you know, if everyone's working remotely, then, you know, why don't we, why don't we automate some of these jobs? Why don't we do these things calls? Why does someone have to hike all the way down uh, to, to the office to just fill in and, and like submit a form? Um, I think the appetite for this has ramped up tremendously. And I, that, that is something that I see going forward, like uh, very concretely from this, just um, the amount of digitization of services we've seen in the last year. Uh, it's been tremendous. Like we went from, like, I think at the start of 2020, we were at about 3 million submissions on Form SG, and now we're about like 100 million. 
Um, and like that's something that just would not have happened if people didn't have to. And uh, yeah, the, the, our goal originally was I mean, really basic stuff, right? Uh, you want to have a government where there's no more paper forms. You want to have a government where like all your data is available to you uh, and you can download it. And you don't have to like go ding dong and put in a million requests. You want you want to be have, well, have dashboards to visualize your um, to make educated policy making. And like, I think that's going to happen. And that's that's I'm pretty I'm pretty excited for that. I, absolutely, absolutely. And Vishal, coming to you, could you please share your final thoughts to round off our session for today? Yeah, so, uh, you know, being someone who has spent, you know, uh, half of his career in open source companies, uh, you know, I'm really excited to hear, you know, from our you know, esteemed panelists uh, today, how they are using open source to power their, you know, mission critical uh, applications uh, in the government sector. So that's really great to know. And I'm also hopeful that we will continue to see a great level of innovation coming out of uh, open source communities. And specifically at, at SUSE, we are constantly working on cutting edge open source uh, you know, projects and collaborating with communities in, in some of the you know, you know, hottest areas from cloud native to, to edge and, and to even you know, enterprise Linux. Amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you to all our panelists for sharing your insights today. And a huge, huge thank you to you and our audience for joining us. We've heard from a fantastic panel on how governments can move and structure themselves differently to roll out digital public services quickly. We hope that you have learned something new and are excited to try out something new with your team. And if you have any questions or would like to know more, please feel free to get in touch with the Gov Insider or the SUSE team. Until the next time, stay safe, take care, and goodbye.